All right, so thank you very much for being on the show, JP. I appreciate you being on here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. You bet. So um, so let's kind of start at the beginning. Um, we, we got to know you through a uh, space and anime panel you did at Otakon. Um, yes. So let's kind of go back to the beginning. Um, how did you get into anime to, to, to start with? Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, it's funny. I've often thought about this, and I, I even have memories of back when I was a little kid, you know, just telling people, like, I like the way that Sailor Moon looks, but I don't like the show. And I don't know what it is about it. And, you know, not realizing the anime was a thing. Mm. And then, you know, I think from there I had the typical, like, you know, Toonami, Dragon Ball Z kind of route. Mm. Uh, and then at some point I discovered stuff, like, with, you know, uh, subtitles. Like, I was watching, mm. I just, through some miracle, found not only a VHS of the first three episodes of Ranma at a flea market, wow. but it was subtitled as well. Interesting. Uh, so, Yeah. And, you know, just so started watching stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, the heyday of Kazaa and finding mm -hmm. stuff that way. And, you know, as I mentioned, I went to the uh, MIT Anime Club. And that was always a really great way to kind of, you know, they would show like three episodes from a series and kind of do uh, oh. three or four series as a showing. Oh, interesting. Uh, and it's a pretty good, pretty good way to pick up new stuff. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I even went so far as to found like an anime club in my high school. And we just kind of watched whatever, you know, we felt like watching and just kind of goofing off. But, yeah, I mean, I just always really liked the aesthetic of it and, you know, just kind of bouncing from show to show. Nice. That's really cool. Um, so what were some of the shows that really sort of stuck with you over time? Um, so, I mean, especially for space stuff, you've got mm. to talk about like Cowboy Bebop is mm. like, you know, almost stereotypical to mention it, but yeah, completely amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, my all-time favorite is a little bit lesser known. It's a uh, Hibernate Renmei. Nice. You guys are familiar with that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, in fact, that show's kind of had a huge impact on my life in a weird way. Mm. I, uh, I found it by, on impulse, we were going to head home from MIT, and we dropped into the anime club to see what they're playing, and I caught the last three episodes. Whoa. I, was like, I was like, I don't know what this is, but this is amazing, and I got to mm. look it up. Uh, found the show, got really, uh, really into it, joined a fan forum, and met a friend of mine on there, went on to become one of my best friends, and because of him, you know, I learned programming, I moved out to Buffalo for a number of years, and it's pretty much why I have the career I have right now, wow. because of this show. <laughs> so yeah, Hibernate Renme is definitely up there for me. Mm -hmm. uh, more recent stuff would be uh, Sword Art Online. Mm. It was, uh, uh, the first, pretty much like the first season of that I thought was really, really great. Mm. Uh, you know, but still we're watching a little bit of the later stuff, but mm. you know, I think it's kind of maybe not quite at the peak it used to be at, but still, mm. you know, really solid stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of other stuff. I've, you know, I've been pretty bad about like keeping up with stuff. I, I think one mm. uh, that that kind of surprised me a couple years ago was me and my friend watched Kaleido Star and really enjoyed that. Oh yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah, pretty goofy, but you know, nice, solid fun and really good look to it. So yeah, it's one of the nice things about anime is that there's such variety and you can find stuff that's like I would never watch this if it were a live action show. Um, you know, yeah. but the, the aesthetic and just the approach that they're taking in this particular iteration is just a lot of fun. Yeah, totally, absolutely. You know, yeah. and, you know, you have I mean, to give me idea. Like, you know, I always like to point out like the crazy range is alongside with Kaleido Star, we were watching Ghost in the Shell standalone complex. <laughs> which is, like, that's a pretty wide uh, divergence there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, uh, Ghost in the Shell. Uh, Got to love that it. one's. <laughs> yeah, that one's fantastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was uh, really great stuff. That was uh, I made. <laughs> never got around to finishing it, but you know, it's funny being surrounded by all these AMV editors. I'm always like, I should probably get around to making an AMV. And I've got about 90 seconds of an AMV for Ghost in the Shell sitting around somewhere. Uh, nice, <laughs> nice. What's it set to? Uh, it was uh, a. Oh, what are they called? Mm. <laughs> I, I've honestly forgotten. <laughs> yeah, Focaloids. I have to look it up and find out. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, t I totally understand. I have I have a handful of AMV projects sort of sitting in the dust from you know years past. It, it happened. Oh, it was Pendulum. That's the artist, Pendulum. isn't it? Oh. And then and then it was uh, I don't know which track it was. They all were pretty similar, but they all make good AMVs. Cool. <laughs> so. Nice. Nice. So you're you're also and I, we have your Twitter account over here on on the screen. So um you know uh, it's clear one of your other uh, uh, big hobbies is uh, is space. Yes, um, absolutely. Uh, where'd that get started, if anywhere? So, I think, you know, space stuff, as far as I can remember, I've always been interested in it. Like, mm. I remember, you know, as a little kid insisting on getting this poster of uh, Atlantis launching. Mm. Uh, I had all these, like, you know, astronomy books and stuff. But um, really, the things that really got me into it, like, you know, I was, you know, definitely more of a fan and more interested in, you know, kind of average people at a certain mm. point. But uh, it was two events that really stuck out were the... Uh, Columbia accident mm. and mm. the landing of the Mars rovers. So these both wow. happened pretty close in time. It was mm -hmm. February 2003 for Columbia and January and February 2004 for the rovers. 
And when we lost Columbia, I just kind of went down this rabbit hole and never came out of. I'm like, <laughs> I need to learn how did this happen? Mm. What happened? You know, what caused this? And just kind of there's more to learn, there's more to learn, there's more to learn. Mm. And, you know, I'm still learning this stuff. Like, you know, I just, you know, finished reading another book about it, you know, just a couple months ago and mm. reading all these, uh, these latest uh, NASA reports on exactly you know, the, the conditions during the breakup. Mm. And then also like on a more positive side was the rovers. It's just like, this is completely incredible that we have these, you know, RC cars bumming around <laughs> on Mars. <laughs> you know, how is this possible? So those mm -hmm. two things really, really started getting me into it big time. Mm. And then, you know, uh, once I kind of became aware of Elon Musk and, you know, SpaceX, mm -hmm. I, you know, it's just like, this is completely incredible. Cause I mean, you know, people ask me why I didn't go into space stuff originally. And it's just kind of like, well, you know, from my point of view, you got to remember, like, you know, the, the shuttles weren't doing so great. Mm -hmm. They're kind of getting ready to wind that stuff down. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, NASA moves at this, at this glacial pace and <laughs> they just really seem to have no direction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just kind of st uh, steered away from it for a little bit. But mm -hmm. then you've all of a sudden you got this crazy guy who is like, you know, you know, going, we're going to Mars. I don't do care it. what happens. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, lately I've become the, you know, big SpaceX fanatic that everyone kind of knows me as now, you know. People will walk up to me. Did you see that? I'm like, yeah, there's lots of helium tank. Blew the second stage of oxygen. <laughs> oxygen. <laughs> wow, wow. So you you really, really got into it then, uh, not just mm. the 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 headline, the mm. the, oh, the details. No, I mean to give you an idea, I recently just paid for this 1,400 uh, page PDF on details on every single shuttle mission, along with their payload configurations and like take off weight and everything and wow. all that crazy stuff. I mean, and actually, you know, speaking of podcasts, yes. I've been kicking around, I've been doing the early research to do a podcast of my own with the idea of being one episode for every manned NASA flight wow. all nice. the way back. So, so right now I'm, I'm steeped in like early Mercury history and like wow. how they're planning on getting people in space for the first time. That must be absolutely fascinating. Yeah, it's funny. Like I always, you know, kind of looked at the Mercury period as mm. kind of like, oh man, it always seemed like kind of dusty and weird and it's got that 50s you know mm -hmm. sheen on it like ah, i don't like it mm. but i was like well if i'm gonna do this podcast i gotta learn about it and you, the more you learn the more it's like man they were really making up as they went along <laughs> and it's really incredible it's just crazy mm. seeing stuff like well we should probably have some sort of centralized group of people who are going to watch the mission and advise on it and like boom chris craft invents mission control mm. <laughs> stuff like that wow. and also the really crazy ideas they had mm. at the time stuff like you know, we're going to launch straight up and then have this inflatable wing. And then what was like, what are you talking about? None of that's happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's amazing. I remember reading a, a book about the early um, uh, balloon launches where they were, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the first um, uh, humans to actually go, you know, outside of the envelope of, of uh, the atmosphere. Um, and just the fact that they, you know, they went up and they're like, oh, wow, there's this thing where we kind of lose our minds after a certain amount of time because of lack of oxygen and all yeah, these things yeah. you, you wouldn't know until you went there yeah so, like as soon as like if you were hitting those like the stratosphere level you're mm -hmm. up around like you know thirty thousand feet and you're going to be in serious trouble you're going to get some real bad <laughs> hypoxia there uh that's why i mean that's what why you know one of the reasons climbing mount everest is so challenging mm -hmm. is there's just no oxygen up there so yeah you know uh, it's crazy. Like, yeah, I, I can't imagine what it was like for those early guys. Just be like, yeah, let's just go up and see what happens. Like, oh no, the atmosphere stops. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that one of the things that really you know, drove home this home to me was the fact that they'd go up and they do these things and they try to um, they talk back to, to Earth and ground control and, and explain things and they'd be stumbling over their words. They'd have no idea what they were doing, but you'd ask them and they'd say, oh no, I'm fine. And realizing that there are elements to these things that trick your brain into thinking that you are okay. Yeah. That you don't know until somebody else tells you about, that's pretty scary. So, yeah, yeah hypoxia especially is very much like being drunk. Mm. Um, there's lots of really interesting, you know, maybe not the happiest, but very interesting <laughs> stories of hypoxia mm. incidents. Stuff like people trying to do uh, high altitude skydiving. And there's an incredible video where the oxygen mm. system in the plane failed. Ooh. And, you know, these guys kind of get, uh, you know, first guys kind of stumble out and they go do their thing. And one guy is just kind of like crawling around and laughing and goofing off. Wow. And then like eventually kind of like sits in front of the door and his friend just like pushes him out. And everyone <laughs> would end up being fine. But mm. just like, it just shows you how quickly, you know, your brain needs wow. oxygen. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's, yeah. yeah. That, those early days, it's just... <laughs> Like, I mean, have you ever seen those Mercury capsules? The mm. astronauts like to, to joke, you don't get in the capsule, you put it on. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like a person-shaped hole in there for them to sit in. And we're uh, Chris Hadfield talking about the, um, you know, the experience of putting a spacesuit on and going out there and saying, 
yeah, the problem is you're not going out for half an hour. You know, it's yeah. it's it, it it becomes a skin in every um, feeling <laughs> and scent that you can think of. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, if you wanted, if you like. There's a lot of really interesting kind of human problems with being in space. Mm. That's one reason I'm such a big proponent of manned space flight mm -hmm. is because, like, you know, robots can do some stuff, but you get a lot of really, like, you know, humans get us a lot of stuff, but you end up with these really strange situations. Like, mm. there's this great book called Packing for Mars by Mary Roach mm. uh, where she talks a lot about these kind of things and just, like, you know, like really crazy and gross stuff like how the astronauts have to practice on the ground for using the toilet in space because mm. it's not a very wide opening and they got to get it right. So mm -hmm. they've got this like mock-up with a camera back there so you can practice your aim. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, and, yeah, th and those suits, they get uh, mm. ripe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. A lot of things we take for granted in gravity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's kind of like, um, you know, Ed White had the first American spacewalk and just mm. kind of had a great time bouncing around out there. And I actually forget who was second. It may have been, mm. I'm not going to guess wrong. Uh, <laughs> basically, he went out there, had a terrible time because he was out there to work. And ah. they didn't realize they kind of forgot equal and opposite reactions. So every mm. time he tried to push on something or turn something, oh. he moved in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. And it was just like this completely, it, it got so exhausting that eventually the flight surgeon called him back in. Because his heart rate was so high, they're like, "You're gonna die out there. You're gonna, get, you're gonna relax, man." Yeah. yeah. And, wow. You know, they had to learn stuff like, "Hey, you got to put little footholds here so they're not just floating mm. around," or you know, all these little things that they take for granted now in space, mm. and they're still just, you know, at the super super early phases. Like, what are we gonna be looking back on in 20 years? It's like, oh wow, I can't believe they had to do that. <laughs> yeah, I once worked with one of the guys who worked on the uh, the um, Hubble repair mission. Oh wow! Yeah, and uh, and he, he talked about um, things like you know, they were like, okay, we got to make um, do these fixes. So we're gonna have to remove twenty eight bolts. And oh, so you talking about uh, Mike Massimino by any chance? Uh, the latest one? No, um, I'm forgetting the guy's name. To, uh, uh, in uh, I must admit, the big Hubble guy I know for sure. Um, is Story Musgrave. Uh, no, th 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 this was a, like an engineer working um, 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 on sort of the, the ground level. Um, yeah. Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt, but yeah, no, it's fine. Bolts. Um, so yeah, and, and they're like, "Hey, got a movie twenty twenty eight bolts, and they can't fly anywhere." Yeah. Wh where do they go? What do we do with them? <laughs> How um, do you secure yeah, them? Right somewhere. Uh, and they actually yeah. ended up doing a um, this. Uh, they they went up with a a uh, plastic container that went over it, and you unscrewed the bolts, and they stayed within the plastic container. So right, they could then right. put it back in, but all these little things where it's like, you gotta have the pieces yeah. back. Yeah, <laughs> um, and and all these things that had just had not been engineered for that kind of repair in that environment. Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, the Hubble was designed to be repaired, but I forget exactly what they were doing. I believe mm. that was STS-125, the final Sounds servicing correct. mission. Yeah. And I don't know what they had to get into, but there's like, look, we gotta swap out some stuff that we weren't meant to swap out. Yep. And that's why they had to do that crazy plastic <laughs> setup and. You know, it's funny because they trained and trained and trained for all these intricate problems, mm. and then they ran into this issue where they just couldn't open the door. Yeah, yeah the, <laughs> it's like this complete non-issue. They're like, "What do we do?" And so while they were out there, mm. some engineers ran to the lab, got a similar handle they had ready to go, and had it all hooked up in a similar way to the uh, Hubble, mm. and they just tried tearing it off. Ah. And they looked, the measure the force required, like, "Yeah, you can do it." So they tell my Massimino, "I'm like, yeah, just just rip it off." He's like. Like, I'm here on this, like, $10 billion space, <laughs> yep. you know, operating on this, like, you know, $5 billion mm. telescope, and I'm just, and he just tears the thing off. <laughs> 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 that should be on his wall. <laughs> yeah. And wow. That's kind of stuff a robot wouldn't be able to do, which is why, you know, I'm such a big proponent of, you know, put people up there. People will figure it out. Learn Absolutely. all sorts of things, yeah. And in the process, uh, just our ability to, to expand out – just uh, what we'll encounter, what we need to prepare for, so when we do come out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything, it's always a huge surprise. You know, it's just like, you know, giving the robots some props here. You know, every single time a probe has gone by, you know, mm. some moon or some planet, every <laughs> single time there's been a completely shocking revelation that no one predicted. Mm -hmm. you know, and we're seeing it all over again with Pluto now, which is awesome. Like, you know, mm. who knew? that Pluto had like this completely active surface and all this stuff going on. And, mm -hmm. you know, what are these mysterious canyons on uh, Chiron and where are they coming from? And, mm -hmm. you know, no one predicted this stuff and it's super awesome. Yeah, I was listening to a podcast just today about the, and I'm, I'm going to uh, forget the names, but where um, it, it was that uh, um, they detected a, a burst of energy um, from, I believe, another galaxy 
Um, and it was like 50 times more intense than anything they'd the recorded wow before. The signal. Yeah, yeah that, that was, was it. That's it. There it is. Um, and just that fact, that, and of course, originally it was like, oh, that's Star Wars. That's where it's actually happening. Um, uh, but then realizing, you know, no, we actually just have to recalibrate what we know to realize that's a possible event as well. Yeah, um, yeah. Just you know, The universe is just far more complex than we think it is every step of the way. Yeah, it's super. Like, this is why, you know, you know I'm always pushing for, like, people like, oh, well, you know, what's the benefit of, like, you know, putting mm. all this money into this stuff? It's like, you don't know. Like, you know, it's like mm. when they're studying electrons and it's just like, hey, we got this weird new force. I don't know. You know, we should probably figure it out. And now look where we are. Yeah. yeah. So studying so, for the sake of knowledge, we find out all sorts of useful stuff that uh, may not have been directly related uh, mm. uh, yeah. to, to the original scope of the project, but then benefits. And, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's why I'm always about, you know, funding basic research because you never, you know, you know, a lot of it's not going to go anywhere, but a lot of it, you know, you never know what you're going to find. No. Yeah. Now, supposedly the space programs come up with all sorts of fantastic things that we use in our lives. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh. Uh, Spinoffs, they call them. They even have a dedicated magazine for it. Yep. Really? Oh, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know, I mean, classic stuff like uh, you've got like the miniatur miniaturization of computers. Like, for mm -hmm. instance, to give you an idea of where Apollo was at. Uh, it was a big deal to use integrated circuits instead of vacuum tubes at the mm. time. Oh, right, my goodness. Right, we're going we're gonna to roll the dice on this and make our computer with integrated circuits instead of vacuum mm. tubes. And then, you know, they had to make that better. They had to make that better. And, you know, satellites, you know, when you're paying $10,000 a pound, mm. you're going to figure out a way to make this stuff smaller. Mm. Uh, you've got your GPS networks. You've got, uh, you know, like kind of funny stuff like, for instance, uh, that gel that's in diapers. Well, NASA mm. invented that because they needed a way to pee in space. <laughs> <laughs> and they just Brilliant. gave it out, you know, in... We've yeah. even got stuff like, for instance, the heat shields that SpaceX uses is a substance mm. called Pika-X, and it's derived from a substance that NASA invented called Pika that SpaceX improved on. It's just like, cool. you know, these are the guys doing this kind of basic stuff and mm. putting the patents out there so that you know, people can get a head start. Yeah, and we, we forget that um, NASA is required by law to you know, distribute all that stuff. I mean, that, that's part yeah. of the Space Act and all that stuff. Yeah, um, sure. So you know, all I mean, of that research becomes uh, useful for everyone. There's some surprising restrictions due to ITAR, oh, yeah. the International Trade Arms sure. Regulations, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, but like for instance, like there's a database out there somewhere of like where every single space, uh, every single heat shield tile was in all the orbiters for every mission, mm -hmm. and they can't release it because it's like, oh well, that's related to this, and that's related to this, and that's under oh. ITAR. But, yeah, wow. yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy the kind of stuff yeah. that's out there, and especially if you are like an aerospace company, mm -hmm. you can get access to ITAR stuff. You can get, mm -hmm. they can get access to so, you know. Elon's always saying you know he'd never <laughs> be where he was if it wasn't for, for NASA giving them this massive head start. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it's also interesting where that gets into things like, uh, um, I remember some, somebody asking for uh, the sort of, so I, I used to work in the office that made Spinoff Magazine um, oh, up at wow. Goddard. Um, oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so w there, there was a story that, that's, that somebody sort of came charging in asking, um, they needed the source code for some satellite um, and, and how it worked. And they, they were just some, some random person. Well, I'm, I'm building something similar and so forth. And, and we were like, um, if we give you that, you know how to take down our satellite. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, um, you know, we're, we're as open as we can be, but there are going to be some yeah. things. What code do you use for your telemetry? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I've tried to fl find software that's flown in space, and it's not mm. easy. No. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. There, there's a whole scrubbing process and all that stuff. So, uh, And, of course, the other problem is, you know, so, mu so much of it is so custom that it's like, okay, you could have this, but whatever hardware you've got is so radically different than what we've got. Right, right, of course. So in yeah. your search for the software, do you, do you get information that uh, just tells you generally what it does, but not how it does it? Mm. Yeah, I mean, so at that point, you're just kind of talking about control theory stuff and just kind of like what I ended up uh, um, compromising with is looking up uh, like ArduPilot and open source drones and stuff. Uh, like that. It's yeah. kind of like, you know, these... UAVs are pretty similar to spacecraft in a lot of ways, like hmm. as far as like you know attitude control and you know yawing to a certain pitch or uh, yawing to a certain degree or whatever you want to do. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, it, I you can get pretty close. Like, there's a great book I think I got it over here somewhere called uh, Digital Apollo hmm. that's all about kind of like uh, a lot of the nitty gritty on how the Apollo landing stuff worked. Interesting. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting book, and you know. It, it, it gets into some real nitty gritty stuff. I, I don't think you know you ever really get the source code proper, but mm. still, like, you know, I ended up learning a lot of crazy stuff. Like, apparently, all of them could have landed under automated control, but every single one of the pilots took away uh -oh. from control from the computer last second. <laughs> Jim Lovell claimed he was going to let the computer land, mm. but he never got the. You know, I the trust uh, <laughs> me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and I've also heard stories about the fact that you know, you know there are certain, um, shall we say, downsides to hi to having. Air Force pilots 
as the people who are doing this stuff because there's a certain ego involved in some things. <laughs> yeah. And so there's, there's a certain amount of retraining of saying, no, I, I know you want to do everything yourself, but just yeah. let the computer handle this. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, I've heard them rephrasing it a lot as like, you know, just letting the computer kind of take care of stuff that it can take care of, which leaves mm-hmm. you free to you yeah. know, focus on the stuff that's really, you know, going to get you dead. Right. So <laughs> that's stuff you got to focus on. Yeah. I suppose it's going to take a little while for society to get used to self-parking cars and things like that before we even have people who are going to <laughs> give that kind of... Uh, I'm telling you, self-driving approach. cars, it's going to be the norm in 10 years. I'm calling mm, it right now, yeah. if not sooner. Because the thing is, the first time they come out and they work and, mm. like, driver deaths start going down and people mm. start realizing they can just, like, you know, hang out and play video games. Oh, I'd love to read the paper or watch a movie in the... Mm-hmm. Yeah. in the three my hour commute, commute. Yeah. my commute is an hour to work and mm-hmm. it's just like oh you know I guess I can read a little bit on the train but like this is killer if I could just get in a robot taxi and show up at work mm-hmm. that's awesome yeah, yeah. there's a, a service that is that is basically a it's sort of a reverse chauffeur where it, it's kind of like Uber but you, you, you go somewhere and you tap a button and somebody shows up on a moped gets into your car and drives it somewhere and you say, I'll be back in three hours. And then three hours from them, they drive your car to where you are. It's been, the, the gas has been filled up. They've, they've cleaned the inside, all this kind of stuff. And, and, and it's the, this ability to just kind of say, okay, you take, you know, I don't want to worry about parking, anything else. Yeah. You take care of all that for me. And, you know, as freaked out as people are about everything else about driving, everyone who hears that says, that, yes, yeah. give that to me. <laughs> if you I know, could let that go, and, and then I don't have to clean the car. Yeah. And if you're comfortable with that random it. stranger driving off with your car, <laughs> how are you not okay with a self-driving car yeah. that has all this intelligence behind it? That's you know, so funny. It's amazing. So my friends often give me crap because I always am ranting about how much I hate driving, but I'm a huge <laughs> fan of like Formula One. And if I uh, want to turn my, cu- my camera slightly, oh, mm. I have a full-on like racing chair with pedals and wheels and everything. Nice. I'm like, yeah, well, that's racing. It's force. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I often yeah. imagine I'm... <laughs> yeah. Well, you know... I. I also don't want, you know, everyone flying jets either, yes, you know, yes. jet pilots can do that. Everyone yeah, else, yeah. you're fine. <laughs> exactly. Like yeah. if, if, you know, if the, everyone on the highway was an actual race car driver, it'd be a lot safer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> totally. Um, so actually, I wanted to uh, uh, circle back to the space panel you did, because it was a really sure. neat idea. Um, I'm, I'm really fascinated by that whole idea of, of looking at um, anime set in space for... And like you said in the panel, it, it, it's not to um, whack on anime for not being rigorously realistic, but kind of saying, okay, how close is it to um, uh, to reality? So um, yeah. to, for the benefit of the folks who, who weren't there, can you kind of just walk through at a very high level what you talked about? Yeah, so, uh, so this was the second uh, iteration of this panel. We-